to page or paragraph 874, missing Toyota Land Cruiser, value of 68,000. Per the report, a vehicle belonging to the ministry got missing. That's not the ministry. No, trade. Yes. Yes. Paragraph 874, page number 244. Got missing in December 2013. Even though the theft was reported to the police, further checks revealed that the forms, the, the documents covering the vehicle, the form A and C, were also not on fire. May you let us know who keeps custody of the company, of the ministry's documents with regards to vehicles? The company has a, a registry where all records and files are kept. Does the ministry have a transport officer, and what are his duties? The ministry has a transport officer, and his duties include the custody and proper care of all vehicles belonging to the ministry. So it means that the, the transport officer takes, he has the uh, documents to the, all the vehicles in his custody. He has access to all the documents on the vehicles. Is the transport officer around? Not in this house. Because we want you to speak to this because, um, Mr. Director, may I know, were you the director then when this vehicle got missing? Yes, I was the director then. Very good. And, um, we believe it was an insider who stole the vehicle. And we believe that it was the, in because of that, the insider had access to the document documents. But we have since found the vehicle. And uh, the, the vehicle, the person is still going through court processes, but as we speak. And the next sitting date of the court is 23rd August. Have you, have you communicated this to the Auditor General? We've sent copies of the police report since the case is not yet disposed of. But the vehicle is still in the care of the police as we speak. On paragraph 871, uh, can the minister tell us a little about Micro Food Processing Company? Is it Micro Food Processing Company? And is it a state owned or? Yeah, my, my rock is a private, uh, privately owned company in the tuna sector, the canned tuna in Tema. Um, there was a problem with uh, the tuna exports to the European Union. And as a result, his company suffered a lot of uh, uh, losses. And government decided that they employ close to 3,000 Ghanaians. So at the time, the government said to save the jobs of uh, these Ghanaians, they should be given a stimulus package to revive the company. It's a private company, and this was meant to be as a stimulus package to that company, as a loan to be repaid. Mr. Chairman, an amount of $16 million, $16 million was given to My Rock Company Limited in a form of loan with an interest of 12.5%. And this, uh, this happened uh, which year? It started in uh, 2013. And per the auditor's report, as of August 2015, mm. not a single dime had been paid to government. I don't know whether the money was for the Christmas or it was, you know, a loan. And if it was a loan, I want to ask you, Director, assuming the money is yours. You give it out. How do you make sure it is paid back? Yeah, if you look at the terms of the loan agreement that he signed, uh, there was a two-year moratorium and uh, a repayment period of 10 years. So as we speak now, he has defaulted for just over a year. He still has close to nine years to repay the loan. He has challenges, uh, other challenges that made it impossible for him to repay during this one year period. He's been dealing with EDIF on how to repay the loan. We have also been in contact with him 
and we visited the company a number of times to have discussions with him to ensure that he starts the repayment the, to take care of the defaulted members and also to pay regularly as and when the rest is due. The agreement, when it defaults, is there a penalty on it or it's the same interest rate? Per the agreement, there will be penalty on defaulted loan repayment, but not on the outstanding amount. You don't, you don't just give out a loan without a process. Be before the loan was given out, did they bring in a collateral? This was uh, given by government as a stimulus package. And normally, stimulus package, that is why it's called a stimulus package. So the conditions are different from a loan, normal loan that is granted. Chairman, assuming he's unable to pay, what happens? Does that mean that the money is gone free? The, uh, that is not the intention. The intention is that uh, he will repay the loan and will follow up. No. On Chairman, it. Mm. it is true. Either he's able or he's not. So what I'm asking is that, assuming he's unable to pay the loan, what happens? I think that there must be clause in the agreement the loan agreement. Yeah, there must be a clause in the loan agreement to deal with how the loan is uh, paid back with the interest and in default. These are the clauses that should be triggered and to deal with the default uh, party. So and can, they, can they make the clause available so that maybe members can have a look at it? Chair, we have a copy of the loan, I believe it's been shared um, with, with this committee. And uh, as I say, the loan is here. It is about seven pages. And as I read it, Chair, I'm just reading directly from the loan. In terms of uh, uh, lack of repayment, the clause doesn't refer to that in terms of the agreement we have here. That, uh, this is the agreement we have here, um, dated 22nd so, so August 2013. So there's a default because um, if the loan uh, is if the loan is contracted and uh, there's a, a period of one year or is it one or two years two years moratorium within which period uh, the person who took the loan cannot start servicing the loan but can only start servicing the loan after two years now the the starting point of service of the loan is 2015, right? So which means that he has defaulted for almost uh, one and a half years or two years now. August 2015 was when he was to start the repayment. Uh -huh. So August 2017, mm. that's two years. Yeah. So two years of default. Yeah. Now we don't have any clause in the loan agreement to how to deal with that situation. So the committee can recommend on what to, to do. We can give uh, this person uh, a period within which he should service the loan. And if he fails to do that, then whatever recommendation that we will make will trigger in. Yes. Who are the shareholders of that? Shareholders and directors of that company? Because I believe that in any contract, there should be a failure clause. Uh, where if someone defaults, there are actions to be taken. So who drew out the contract and that particular aspect eluded the person, whether it was intentional or not intentional. So firstly, the shareholders, now the drawers of the contract, and why they refu refused to bring in a default clause. Chair, my understanding is that this contract was drafted by the legal department of the Ministry of Trade Industry, and there simply is no clause in it for the repayment. And I believe your question and your comments are absolutely apt. They're valid. There should have been a clause in here that says that if you don't repay, we do X, Y, and Z, even if in the lack of no security, that should have been in there. The clause, the agreement that I have in front of me, it just simply has an expiration, 
and then it has uh, it ex it expects and then it has another clause here which is actually quite relevant that this is the entire agreement of the contract um, and um, and hence the necessity and the discussion going through but I think the point chair is valid uh, what about the shareholders in terms of it? shareholders this this agreement is signed by am I allowed to mention names chair yes yeah, right? sure. This is signed by uh, a Charles Yao Mensa on behalf of Myrock Food Processing in the presence of Barnabas C. K. Appiah. Is there any clause to revisit the contract, renegotiate? Chair, looking at this contract, at best I would say it's a simple contract. There is no clause that looks at variation, and there is no clause that looks at renegotiation. Since it was drafted by the legal department, can we have administrative head of legal, me the whole legal department, can we have administrative sanctions for the people who drafted this law? This is, to me, a disservice to the nation. Looking at the amount that is involved, there is no security, there is nothing like repayment, uh, default conditions, and it was drafted by learned personnel of high repute of a ministry. Please, please. <laughs> so any administrative sanctions for, for poor performance? Chair, I would just check with the chief director and obviously what other processes we have within our um, public services commission, because these are obviously employees of the government we will pursue as directed by this commission, by this okay. committee. Okay, then the, the, you are so directed to finish this committee with more information. Uh, my, my questions will still be directed to the contract in question. Would you be, would you be kind enough to, to tell this committee who your head of legal is at Ministry of Trade and Industry? Currently the or head. at the time? At currently or at the time? The or contract. at the time, at if, the time, if the chief director can tell this committee who the head of legal at the time was? Uh, one, Kofi Amenya, but he has seen, uh, attained the age of 60 years and is already retirement. Because from what you are telling the committee, I suppose that there is no even an arbitral clause. There's no arbitral clause. So that when there, is, there are disputes on the contract, which court, which forum to go and litigate or resolve the matter, the contract does not con contain an arbitral clause. Chair, looking at the contract as a sign, we have a, the, the, what would refer to that most appropriately is the law, gov the law governing the contract, which refers to um, the contracts governed by the laws of Ghana. So in effect, any law of Ghana, if we read this contract, I'm not a lawyer. Yes, yes, it's, a, it's called uh, arbitral clause. Okay. So that now, yeah. now, I see from, from, from the paragraph 871, that the payment to my rock was done in three tranches. The first one was on the 22nd of August 2013, five million Ghana cities, five million dollars, at the rate of 2.00 to the, uh, to the city. No, no, one to two at that time, and then, and then three weeks later, you, you, that is on the 8th of September, you made another payment of five million US dollars. So within one month, you paid him 10 million US dollars. Does the contract contain the circumstances under which you make these tranche payments? that if it is a stimulus package, the company is supposed to apply the first tranche payment for a certain phase of the project in the company. When that is done, then the second tranche payment would have been released. Does any clause contain these conditions? Chair, we have three different contract years, I'm being informed, and each one of them refers to different aspects of it, of the, of the agreement. 
So as we look at the third aspect, um, which one the third one? The first and the second are one. Honourable Minister, yes. I, I, I believe my, my, my other colleagues on the committee want to appreciate the answer. Yes. There are three answer. separate there are contract. agreements. Mm -hmm. The contract is split, the three agreements, loan, but this has yeah. been shared with the committee. Yes. Loan agreement 1A, dated 20. There's three. Let me start with the earlier one. <coughs> one dated the 21st October 2013. Second one dated the 22nd of August 2013. And third one dated 3rd of September 2014. And I believe these refer to the drawdown amounts that you have referred to. So, okay, so that we are on the same page, if you open to page 244 of the... Uh, of the of the Auditor General's That's report. Correct. There's a table that tells you how the drawdowns were made. That's correct. The first one on the 22nd of August. Mm -hmm. So if you can locate. So that is the agreement referring to the 22nd of August agreement. Um, there is no reference on here what is provided to you, but I believe that agreement has been provided, dated the 21st of, 22nd of August 2013. And that agreement specifically ten, refers to what it is that the money is going to be associated with. My sense on looking at the three agreements is that you have one agreement for each drawdown. That's why we have three. And then each is, it talks about the, the use of the agreement. So it talks about the bailout back package, 10 million cities, the duration, interest, moratorium, repayment schedule. Agreement should be tabled for the committee to look at it carefully and make the necessary recommendations because it is most irregular. In my many years of practice, I've never seen a facility agreement drawn in such a manner. And it is not the best practice. And so, so Chairman, that will be my, my prayer to the committee. Looking at the exchanges between the Deputy Minister and my colleague, it means that the money was even given before this uh, uh, masquerade of an agreement was made. Just refer to the first agreement, according to the report, was dispersed on 22nd of August 2013. It is the same date as the agreement. The second disbursement was 8th of September 2013. The date of the agreement here is 3rd of September. 3rd of September, 20, no, no, I think, no, no, sorry, good. it's 21st October 2013, let me repeat that. The second tranche was dispersed according to this note on the 8th of September 2013. The agreement is dated the 21st October 2013, so that confirms the second point. And then the third tranche was dispersed on the 5th of September 2014, and the agreement is dated the 3rd of September, so it's one day, two days before. So there's one that... So the second one is prior, post -dates post -dated. The, the first one is on the same date, the second one the agreement is after, and the third one it is two days before. So it's okay. the second tranche. Okay, let us put that on our side. We'll, I think we'll uh, deal with the terms of the contract itself. But now, coming to, I mean, if we even put the contract aside, mm -hmm. coming to the real business. Now, you don't have any collateral from uh, the responses you gave, that because it's a stimulus plan. But I know that every reasonable plaintiff, if I should put it that way, will have to mitigate his loss. Have you followed the trajectory of this company as far as its production, viability, and profits, um, or its whether it is profitable, have you followed its activities to see that your money stands the risk of being lost, or you have the reasonable expectation that the company is doing well, and so you can get your money back? Yeah. The uh, company is, in fact, as I said, it was fairly profitable until the ban of uh, tuna products to the European Union. And we had every belief that uh, with the lifting of the ban and the support that was given, we had every belief that the company can be profitable. 
And uh, we also did not want the workers, close to 3,000, to be sent home. So we have the belief that even as of today, the company can still turn around its fortunes. My question simply is this. As at now, do you have any hopes of receiving your money or you have fears of losing the money? Still have nine years. And uh, he, we are in talks with him, even uh, where he, uh, he's also in talks with Edith on the repayment of the loan. It's, he's not saying that he doesn't owe. He's not saying that he will not pay. It's just that things have not yet turned around because of the period that he lost the uh, exports to the European Union. Are you not concerned that for the past two years, even if it's assumed things are not very good, they have not even made a single payment, are you not concerned? Yes, we are, not, uh, we are concerned, but we haven't lost hope. Chair, um, just as a matter of record, I just want to also say that we have, we did invite the company to be with us here. The Chief Director did invite the company to be here, as per the instructions in your letter. Yeah, we haven't seen him. I just Please. wanted to make that for yes. the record. Um, uh, Chair, sorry. I, um, I also want to refer to a letter which was, uh, I believe, also shared from Honorable Dr. Ecosby Ogarbra that explains the background to, to MIROC, including in this first point, Chair, with your permission, that the part of the reasons for the government intervention are first to avert the collapse of a vi viable Ghanaian owned export led company, and secondly, to mitigate the negative impact of an EU directive on, on illegal, unregistered, and unregulated fishing which adversely affected Myrock's export of tuna to the European market. Uh, we're happy to share that as well. Just to give a bit of background as to why, uh, according to the Honorable Minister, the facility was shared. Kindly tender in that document. Yeah. Right. In addition to the agreement. But that still comes. Was he, is it the only company that was operating in Dutch industry? The only Ghanaian-owned company at the time. What steps are being put in place to avoid these types of occurrences? And I ask this question in light of the fact that government has shortlisted 80 companies which are set to receive stimulus packages from government through the Ministry of Trade. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the two three key differences, I would say, to this particular process that we're putting in place now. The first thing is that um, the majority of the funds we expect for these processes will be from private sector. So they'll be from banks, venture capital funds, and we're actually leveraging the amount that the government of Ghana has put forward to raise more capital. So in effect, first point is that there would not be 100% lending of anything from government to the private entity. And in doing that, almost by definition, the banks or the venture funds will not sign such an agreement or agree to any kind of third-party due diligence that they haven't done themselves. So I think that's the first point. The second point is that as a Ministry of Trade Industry, we have taken on a group of external, uh, we call them the technical support group, financial experts, both engineering and operation, that are preparing all due diligence reports on every one of the companies that made an application to us. So we have a due diligence report similar to the one the chair has asked for from EDIF, uh, um, I'm speaking through the chair, from EDIF, so that these reports can be made available to, to the Auditor General as and when uh, he or she decides to, to visit. The third area is that once we have done all of our analysis, these reports, as we speak, in fact, we shared some yesterday and we'll do some this afternoon, are shared with the financial institutions because all of the funds are being put through the financial institution. Nothing is being signed by government of Ghana as a direct. Everything is being put through the financial institutions. And so what it means is that they themselves are also doing their own due diligence based on all the work we're providing to them. So we'll end up in a situation where these companies would have gone through at least three levels of sifting. That will mean that by the end of the time we're making any facilities available to them, those facilities will be done through 
pre-listed four local venture capital funds and four banks that to date have made commitments to the stimulus package. So I hope that should give some comfort to the members of this committee. Despite all these measures, does it include assessment okay. of the capacity of these yes. companies okay. in so, terms of repayments? Oh, thank you very much. So the due diligence done initially by the technical services agreement looks exactly at that, not just the capacity to repay. We are reviewing the market that they're looking to provide. We are reviewing the management capability of the companies. And in some cases, we are providing some technical um, support technical support as well to them. So that is done by a technical support group. Then the same thing is also done by the banks, who will go through all of their normal processes. And as you know, before a bank will lend you a cent, they will make sure that every single I is dotted and T is crossed, which would include all those aspects that we referred to. So that by the time we get up a situation where funds are, are made available to a, a worthy company, they will only be done so, Chair, once we have made sure that they have the ability to pay, the market they're engaged in is a market that is real, and that the management has the capacity to deliver what they say they're going to do. And we're making it very clear, Chair, through this dialogue that this is not free money. We expect it to be repaid. It's a money for stimulus, not a grant. Therefore, that they have to pay it back. We have duly exhausted this, because we are still going to get those documents and then review them and then take a decision. We do have those written documents and more than happy to share that with the committee. Time turned down so that we look at it as a committee. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do so. My name is Samuel Atamils and the MP for Commander Edna Egwafo Abraham. <laughs> now, let me ask about Commander Sugar Factory. 2016. I tasted some of the sugar from Comenda Sugar Factory. 2016, I know that um, the ministry or parliament approved, I think about $24 million to get the farmers to produce sugar cane for Comenda Sugar Factory. I drive past it and this sugar factory is not operating, Mr. Minister, Mr. Chief Director. Tell us the true state of Commander Sugar Factory and what is going on. Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I, w I hadn't quite brought my documents. <laughs> <laughs> Chair, I'm led by you. Honorable Minister, you can respond to the question. Thank you very much. Uh, um, and I want to thank Chair for the question. Like yourself, um, my father is a Fante, High Street, which now is named, I believe, um, uh, President Arthur Mills High Street. We've been there for 140 years, so I have as much passion. And him being a member of the CPP, you can uh, uh, the Workers' Brigade, sorry, Adjutant General, you can imagine the passion we have with some of these areas. Here is the current reality of Commander Sugar. The sugar you tasted at that time the government of Ghana bought the uh, semi-processed sugar in. Part of it was used to process, and that is part of what you tasted. We have never put cane sugar through the full system of the Commander sugar. That's the first thing we have to note. The second area we have to note is that the total land area for that Commander sugar of our two odd thousand have, doesn't have the capacity to produce the cane sugar. So we have to look at places around Winneba, I understand those are where we have a bit more land to make sure that we have the appropriate acreage. We ex estimate between 15 to 18,000 acres is what is needed to make sure that whatever cane we produce is available for the, um, the actual factory to process. The third area I want to talk about is that there was a nursery started but that nursery grew the same variety that had always been grown around the Commander area. The Indian um, company that was brought in brought in a little bit of a variety from India that they grew, but the process of a proper nursery to identify the actual variety was never done. So we have currently, there were 125 acres that were set aside for nursery. 25 of it is ready to be transplanted. 
to the two or thousand. The problem we have is that if we transplant those 25 to 2,000, it's basically a waste of money because the sugar content of that variety, as we know, is not to the level needed to make a commercial operation of Comenda. So what are we doing about it, which I'm sure is what we really all want to know, how we can get this Comenda sugar up and running. The first thing we're doing is that, as per your point, agreement was signed for the 24-odd million, uh, what is, it, is that total? 24.5 million uh, dollar facility. We have gone through all the process of uh, Exim India. As we speak, we have, you know, you have to go through process of selecting a consultant to come through, and they have to write something that's called a DPR, which is a detailed project report. Detailed project report. In effect, for lay people like ourselves, what they have to do is come and look at the project and describe what the project is and how we are going to put together a proper plantation to make sure, and part of that analysis is to identify the variety that is appropriate. So this is something we expect to, to we've had to go through the process with the Africa, uh, um, India Exim. We will put a consultant in place, and we, as we write, we're negotiating to make sure, for instance, a number of things that happened. One, we got a letter of interest from UCC that stated that they even want to do some work around varieties. I also understand that there are some varieties at Legon that they have done. So what we are now trying to do is so we don't reinvent the wheel, making sure whoever the consultant comes in has to then work with our existing institutions. So some knowledge is also left back. So maybe in the future, when we're doing these things, our own scientists can provide us the variety. So that's a key component of what they're doing. That will then write the report that we have to submit to India Exim. We expect from the day we start to when we we'll probably get cane is the 18 to 24 months. That is just the reality. But to do that, we also have to get enough land with irrigation to make sure we have for the, for the, um, for the commander sugar. So I have personally visited the, the, the houses of chiefs in, um, in, in Cape Coast. We sat with them. I went there with the uh, um, uh, Honorable Kwamena Duncan's team. We put together actually a team. And I've requested that they should identify 50,000 acres anywhere within the central region because it's possible, you know, because there are parts of central region where um, a lot of the cane is used for, um, what do we call it, I don't know the English name, Aquitishi. <laughs> so we know that's possible, but then we have to then go through the 18 to 24 month period, but we need the land. The vast majority of this land will be outgrower scheme where we're looking at providing, I expect 70% of it outgrow. But the plantation will need its core because the soils around Commenda is not appropriate. It's just, you have to put so much in there, but we know within the central region we can still do that and manage Commenda to work. But in the interim, we're not going to go to sleep in terms of where it is. We want to look at a way of doing exactly what you referred to, where you tasted the sugar, where as an interim, as a, as a government, we can look at bringing in perhaps a management agreement with the viewpoint of operating this, even if we bring in semi-processed cane sugar, they will process it so that we can get some sugar. And to that effect, I've sat down, and I think I can share this with my old company, Coca-Cola Company, and with Diageo, and they've agreed to work with us to make sure the quality certification comes through, and then they will buy sugar from Comenda so that we get some upside in terms of where we are. So these are a number of the things we're actually trying to do. We have a committee which I chair, within trade industry, and we're looking at all of this. Uh, Chair, since the question was asked, we also have a fundamental challenge where we have bills that has been presented to the Minister of Industry for the total of nine million. Six, by just under seven million US dollars, which apparently we as a government owe to the company. And as we speak, we're having a lot of discussions with those companies, and part of that is apparently um, an agreement we signed, let me use the word signed in inverted commas, for some management of the facility, some association with the nursery, which I explained to you, does not have the right variety. So this is something we are very, very keen on looking at. Commenda will operate, but we want to make sure when it operates, it operates on a commercial footing to ensure that it will keep going. And we want to bring in the local farmers involved. So I hope that answers the question.